practices that face data gaps or programs that could have been improved with better access to data. So can I just see a raise of hands? Okay, almost everyone here, thanks. So there are many examples that I could give of how limited data leads to inefficiencies in our sector. Our team in Cambodia, when we were doing surveys, as one example, we found that there have been eight sanitation campaigns among the same households. And, you know, we're still reliant on manual data collection, as Engineer Lindbergh said. Um, this, let's see if I can get this to work. Oh, we have sound. Sorry. Um, this is a short video of our team in Kenya doing mobile phone data collection in a low income area because often this is the only way to get data by manually collecting information on who has access to water and sanitation services. But there has got to be a better way. We heard from Engineer Lombard this morning that you know, data is one of the five accelerators for the SDGs. You know, we're, we're on the cusp of a data revolution. So I'm going to give you three examples of potential solutions that Aquaya is exploring to improve the data culture in WASH. So the first, to make data more accessible, is Centralizing WASH data, or Project W, which is essentially a WASH atlas, a centralized data directory and analytics platform for WASH stakeholders to learn, respond, and invest in effective services. So basically think of the Google of WASH data, or a one-stop shop. So basically this searches all different web portals to collate information in one place. So currently we have over 4,500 data sets and 400 web portals that this draws from. And secondly, we are working to identify WASH vulnerable populations. So who are the poor people that really need WASH services? We are currently funded by Google. We're currently working with high resolution satellite imagery and artificial intelligence to identify low income areas in Kenya. So this, I know the figures are kind of small, but these are satellite imagery that you can, we work to outline the low income areas and then divided our data sets into training and test data sets to look at the accuracy of identifying these low income populations. And then this information is currently used by Sanergy and water utilities to target their services. And we have a similar program in Ghana where we're working with Safe Water Network on identifying the poor using different machine learning techniques. And third, with funding from USAID, we've developed the Sanitation Planning Tool, or SAN Plan, which is a prototype data visualization tool that provides highly localized contextual data for sanitation planning and monitoring across 18 countries. Because, as we know, it's not only about having the data, but translating that data into knowledge so that it can be used to inform decision making. And currently, this tool is being used as part of the Enhancing WASH program in Ghana, led by Global Communities, which is a $45 million USA program to improve WASH services. And we know, I know that we have Alberto Wild, the chief of party, that will be joining us for the panel later. So what's next? We invite you to join us in building a WASH data culture. So we can do better, and data will help us get there. Today we've discussed how data can help identify key populations and customize WASH solutions. And I know a big part of the UN Water Conference is thinking about what are we going to do next? You know, what commitments can we make? And we're going to be talking about this during the panel. But one thing that Aquaia is currently doing and commits to doing is to make all of its non-confidential data open source and publicly, publicly accessible. And we'll be talking later about what are you doing in your organizations for this. Um, I have our QR code for our website here and the sanitation planning tool um, link, which I'm not sure if you can see, but um, it's sandplan.app there. Um, and I just also want to say that Quiet is hiring as well. So if you know of great WASH data people, please um, connect us there. So thank you very much.
Thank you so much, Rachel. With that, we'll invite John Ferry up to from M Water for our next presentation. All right, thank you very much. Um, it's really great to hear uh, what you guys are doing in Acquire Rachel as well. And uh, Engineer Manu, thank you for kicking us off. Um, my name is John Fury. I'm one of the co-founders of Dan Water. It's great to see so many uh, familiar faces here and some new faces I don't know. Uh, today, we, we have just a few minutes, and what we wanted to do is uh, think a little bit about um, where does data come from in the water and wash sector. Um, generally, we think of it, um, you know, there's, there, you, you may have your own categories, but when we try to think through this, um, I think there's four kind of um, buckets that you can put it into. The first would be traditional m and &E. So this would be like log frames and uh, results matrices and all these kinds of things that programs need to know how they're doing, right? Um, second, we have uh, household surveys, which inform the, the uh, indicators for the SDGs in many countries because there's a lack of other kinds of data available. Um, these are household surveys. They're expensive. They're done infrequently. Um, Third, uh, you have the data repositories. So this was, you know, kind of the, you know, the, the root of this was people saying, well, there's so much data already out there on water and sanitation. There must, if we could just put it all in one place, we would, we would have some, you know, something we could learn from it. Um, and a lot of those are, are useful uh, for certain things, uh, especially for, you know, making comparative analyses. Uh, but what we wanted to focus on today is uh, government data and government data systems. So what do we mean by that? Uh, everything from service provider data, service providers going and collecting, uh, you know, data on services, you know, the, the meter readers, the frontline workers, the extension agents, all of them, all the way up to the Ministry of Water and uh, their databases. So each one of these activities is important, but what we see often is, especially with ME, which can be 15 to 30 percent of the budget of, of large programs, we see it increasingly as a missed opportunity to invest in government data systems. Um, and so what we've been trying to do over the past few years is develop a way uh, to use all of these investments that are made into data collection as an investment in the government data systems to connect more of the system to itself. Uh, what we, you know, we're really inspired by this, this idea of connecting frontline workers to the data that they need to do their job and using that data to inform all the other indicators that we're interested in, everything from non-revenue water to performance uh, service provision and everything on up. All of these other data sources are very interested in building out government systems. And you often see you know, portions of a project devoted to strengthening government, government systems, but it's often a very small amount and it, it tends to be technology focused instead of focused on building the capacity and ability of the, of the organization to, to do data analytics. So uh, I'll just give two quick examples of some success that we, we think we're starting to have in this area. Uh, one is with the USA Water and Sanitation Project in Haiti. Uh, this activity just concluded uh, last year. Um, it was a five-year investment and USAID in this case decided to instead of having a separate M&E activity to inform all the indicators, they use the investment in government data systems as a way to inform actual program indicators that were recorded out upon out to the organization uh, through USAID. And as a result, we started with a few utilities, and by the end of the, the program, we had all uh, urban water utilities in Haiti reporting on these indicators. Um, they were having progress in key performance indicators uh, at, by the end of the project that they were you know, making themselves. They were having monthly meetings and updating this. Um, and that was really exciting to see. And then when USA came to you know, do the, um, the M&E evaluation, uh, they were able to just do spot checks on this data. So that was really exciting. Um, this is what it looks like. This is the dashboard we built for a utility. Um, each utility has their KPIs. The national KPIs were defined in, in a series of workshops. Um, and each one of them was collecting this monthly uh, by the end of the project, 100% participation. Um, at the end of the project, they realized they needed more information on the infrastructure. So we, we worked together with them to build a global asset management standard that's based on their actual experiences. Um, and they were, able, they were able to map all the pipe networks of uh, several utilities in the country and use this to reduce non-revenue water by you know, knowing what kind of pipes are installed, knowing where frequent uh, failures have been, um, and also tracking uh, customer complaints. 
Uh, more recently, uh, it's, it's great to have a representative from, from the Republic of Uganda here with us today because I just came back from there where um, we were working with uh, the Hilton Foundation who was interested in the baseline of a particular area, um, but they were also interested in making a sustainable uh, data investment in the, the government data systems. And by doing that, we were able to take uh, what would have been a once-off you know, data collection event that would then maybe feeding one of these international repositories someday, uh, eventually, you know, up to the government. Uh, but now we have a real-time data system where the district water officer can look at an individual water point and see a photo of what's going on at that place. Uh, they can see how old the information is. They can, you know, when they're in the field, they can have offline access to it. Um, and the, the most exciting thing to the folks that we've been working with has been that, you know, when they see a water point that has been labeled as functional and someone says it's not working, they can actually check, uh, you know, down to the, uh, the level of the photo. And that's really, really exciting to, to them and to us. So uh, this is just a taste of what we think is possible if we turn these investments uh, that we're making that are very large in data systems and technology into investments in government systems um, through databases and other technology that, you know, mobile technology as well that's been uh, coming out recently. So we encourage everybody to think about this, how you could do this in your own, you know, programs and, and turn these, you know, once-off expenditures into investments in government systems. So that's all I have to say, but thank you very much. Uh, and we look forward to the panel. Great. Thank you so much, John, and thanks to Rachel as well. Um, I hope those give some, some ideas about what is possible with data and data science and some of the emerging tools that are coming out. Um, now we're going to move over to our panel discussion, so I'll ask all of the panelists to please come forward and take a seat. Um, now we kind of want to shift and talk about a little bit of, um, you know, I, I think it's exciting to see what, what could be. Please come forward. Don't be shy. <laughs> um, but we also know that there are challenges to making this a reality um, uh, across the sector and getting governments and their partners um, really using data to its fullest. And so um, we've, we've put together a couple of commitments. Rachel will talk about this more and some draft commitments about how we could improve data use in the sector. We're going to have our panelists um, speak to some of the challenges and maybe some concrete actions that we can take to improve data use. So with that, I'll hand it over to Rachel, and she'll introduce our panelists. Great. Well, thanks so much. I'm, I'm really excited to have such a, um, in, you know, interesting and, and diverse panel up here. Um, so I'll maybe introduce you first, and then we'll jump into questions. So I'll start um, from this side. So we have Edelina Alfai, who is World Vision's Regional Wash Director for Southern Africa. Welcome, Edelina. And then we have Kia Riedel from the Conrad and the N. Hilton Foundation, and so she's a program officer. Thank you, Kia. Welcome. And then we have Engineer Lumber O. Weni, who was here earlier from the Uganda Ministry of Water and Environment. We have John Ferry, who you already heard from M Water. And then we have Eric Viala, who's a specialist leader with Deloitte. And then we have Rick Johnston from JMP WHO. So thank you. Welcome, everyone. We also have Alberto. On oh, right. Thank you so much. Sorry, Alberto. We have one panelist joining virtually, um, Alberto Wild from Global Communities, um, who is also the chief of party for USAID Enhancing Wash Program in Ghana. Okay, we're going to get them up on the screen too. So thank you so much. Um, so we're going to start, as Jessica said, by talking about different commitments. You know, what can we actually do to build the WASH data culture? So I'm going to start by with Rick Johnson from WHO, and and the JMP, the Joint Monitoring Program, is really host is really our go-to data source for WASH data, in, you know, in the sector. Um, I want to ask you, you know, so our, our draft commitment here is about establishing sector alignment around key definitions um, and indicators. So I want to ask you, Rick, how can governments and development partners begin to work towards better standardization of indicators and definitions? Thanks, Rick. Thanks so much, Rachel. 
Um, and it's a great topic, close to my heart. So uh, alignment and harmonization um, takes effort. It can take money, it can take time, and you should only do it if the benefits are gonna outweigh that investment. And it's not always the case. Like if you, if you have your own little project that's not gonna interact with anyone else, design your own indicators and you know, go. The, the, the benefits come though when you're interacting with other players. And that can happen at different scales. So I want to talk a little bit about like the national scale and then just a few words on the global scale uh, with some examples. So at the national scale, um, the JNP led a, a, a harmonization workshop a few years ago in Tanzania. Um, and we found that the, the sector and different institutions within the sector were using different terms to describe sanitation facilities and especially what counts as an improved latrine. So we found that like the, not only was the statistical office using one set of definitions, but even different household surveys were using different sets of definitions. Um, and you know, there, there, you can have discussions about what should or shouldn't count, but they hadn't had those discussions. And the end result is that none of the data were comparable. The WASH sector didn't recognize or value the data being collected by the statistical office. And it's a waste, it's a waste of resources because a lot of money is spent collecting this data that then isn't valuable to the sector. And it's a waste of opportunity because again, you could uh, collect data that could inform programming if you could align around some key definitions. And following that workshop, they established the, this, uh, the National Statistical Office established a technical working group to harmonize indicators and definitions so that you know, data could be more useful to, to other partners. Uh, if we look at a global scale, um, of course, there's the SDG example, and there's aligning indicators and definitions around that. But what's the payoff to a country to invest in aligning um, national indicators with global ones? Mm -hmm. Not necessarily so clear. You know, it's nice to have a number in the SDG tables, but what's really important at the country level is informing national programming, right? So I think one of the big values that comes from aligning uh, with higher scale, like geospatial scale indicators, is that it gives you the opportunity to benchmark with, with peer organizations or countries. So I think a lot of countries really, you know, they don't care about like the global progress to SDG, you know, quadruple the race, whatever, but they wanna know like, how's my neighbor doing? You know, um, and, um, and that's only possible when you can align and have comparable data. So I think the benefits are there. I think IPNet is another example of global alignment, standardization of indicators. They're just launching a rebooted uh, IPNet 2.0 this week, actually, with a small set of 15 key performance indicators that utilities can use to benchmark their, their progress against one another. Great. Thanks, thanks so much, Rick. Yeah, I really appreciate that. I see we have a question. We're actually going to hold questions for about 20 minutes, um, and then, but we are going to open it up. So thank you so much. And, and thanks, Rick, for bringing up the example that, you know, forming a technical working group in a country is, you know, a, a way to standardize indicators and also thinking about benchmarking. And if you do want to compare against different, um, across different projects or organizations, we really need that. So thanks. Um, so next we're going to talk about open data sharing, you know, so, you know, between governments, implementers, private sector, and other stakeholders, you know, how can we make sure that the data is, um, is shared? And so I'm going to ask Italina from World Vision to, um, to speak to this one. And my specific question for you is around, you know, as an implementing organization that collects the significant amounts of data, um, you know, what systems or processes are in place for data sharing? Thank you for that question. Um, I'm also passionate about data and uh, World Vision um, recognized that um, data collection and also sharing, it's really important for us to ensure that we are serving everyone everywhere we are working. So uh, World Vision is also um, using uh, digital tools uh, to collect information for planning, also to um, uh, to ensure that uh, uh, we are meeting the pro we are uh, meeting the progress, and also for us to measure impact that we are doing. Um, but in many cases, um, uh, not only World Vision, but uh, many partners that are, are constructing facilities, um, they are collecting that information, and when 
it comes to commissioned infrastructures, the focus is more on the infrastructure itself, not only um, a commission, uh, also the information that um, uh, was the base for planning, for implementation, and also to, uh, 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 to communicate what was achieved. So it's really important, and as World Vision, we also um, uh, we recognize and we commit ourselves to uh, improve that process of commissioning of facilities, not only to deliver and commission to the local governments, to the communities that we are working with, the facility infrastructure itself, but also the information that, were, that uh, helped uh, the process of uh, planning, construction, and also uh, or, or, um, um, the, the, the results because it's really important. Uh, 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 in many cases, we, saw, we, we see ourselves uh, when we want to plan uh, future activities or interventions. There is no information. We, we have to start from the beginning. We, we have to start from zero. But when we have all this information combined and shared among different partners, it's easy for us to start from somewhere and also to measure the impact we are doing as a sector. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Elena. It's great to hear that you know you're able to build upon the data too, right? And it's you're not just starting from from scratch. Because I feel like too often we, we do see that happen. I'm also going to ask Alberto Wild to to speak to this open data sharing um, as part of the enhancing wash program in, in Ghana. Thank you, Alberto. Thank you. Um, hope you can hear me well. Yes. So, great. Thanks. Uh, Thank you, Rachel. So basically one of the things that I want to comment is that often local governments, they have very fragile systems, uh, which at times they have different systems that they don't communicate with each other, which makes it very difficult to integrate the data. Also we have implementing partners or even donors, which they create separate uh, tracking systems. And many of these, and there's a lot of evidence that many of these uh, systems, they are alive, um, or they, they continue to be alive up to the time where the funds run out. And then those systems, as, as good as they can be, they, they're abandoned. So therefore, there's a big need to centralize and to develop uh, more efficient systems that can make uh, that can be accessible to governments, donors, implementing partners, private sector. If we if we're calling for private sector to invest in the into the water sector, sanitation sector, they need to have access to this uh, data information. So, for example, the sanitation plan, the sand plan, it's it's a good example of a centralized system that needs to be expanded, uh, incorporated. So, this will allow. Uh, the data sharing that we are all seeking uh, and to, to have uh, informed decisions and to be able to make better decisions for every country. I will pause here, Rachel, over to you. Thank you. Great. Th thanks so much, Alberto. Thank you for joining us from Ghana. Um, yeah, and I think, I think you made a good point about, you know, we are often still in this mentality of projects or, you know, that often we're in limited to funding cycles where systems are built and then they're abandoned. So, um, yeah, let, let's think about how we can build beyond that. On, on the open data point, I did also want to mention that um, IGRAC has developed an open data commitment. Some of you may have seen this as part of the UN Water um, event. And so, you know, that's something that, that we can all have a look at and, and consider signing. So thank you. Um, let's see, I want to move over to our PowerPoint. Maybe I'll just ask for some tech support as we do that. Um, but for our, our next next commitment is around data quality. And you know, so talking about standards to facilitate data reuse and, and provide decision makers with accurate, reliable information. You know, we have to make sure that the data is good. Um, many of us have heard the phrase garbage in, garbage out, right? We don't want to be in that situation. So I'm going to ask M Water and um, John from M Water about you know where where they have the greatest challenges with data quality and how they overcome those challenges. 
Uh, yeah, this this always comes up, especially you know governments are very interested in data quality as well because they are accountable to their people. You know, so if if there's if the system says something that's not true, it could be very serious, you know, political repercussions. Um, I think the most important thing in terms of data quality is that if we are collecting data that's actually being used every day uh, by frontline workers, the quality has to be high. So if you're collecting extractive data, you're going in and sort of like you know, doing a survey, you know, you don't you don't know if you've got the full picture in any, any evaluation that you do. Uh, so that's just one type of data. But if we focus on enabling, you know, the use of data by people who are there at the, the house, who are reading the meter, who are, you know, asking someone to pay a bill, uh, that data had better be high quality or else they're going to, you know, the people are going to have a problem with, with, with uh, paying their bill. Uh, so I, I think, you know, it starts there. Uh, there's an, also an aspect that we've noticed uh, this happened in Haiti, especially um, that over the project, we built sort of a, a culture of uh, a data driven culture, as we call it. Um, and what that, you know, looked like was people were really interested in comparing, you know, to each other, the latest data. Like if you worked in another utility, you were really interested in the ones around you and how they were doing. And did they report last month or, you know, are you ahead or, you know, are you doing better in a particular indicator? Um, so building that culture where people like look to data every month to know how they're doing, um, you know, that depends on real time, you know, accurate data as well. So if, if we could focus on that, I think it, that, you know, it will manifest itself as reliable aggregated data when we, when we look at, you know, the bigger picture of the region or the, the whole country. Thanks. Thanks, John. And I know this links back to Rick's point earlier about benchmarking too, and people you know, wanting to compare with, with their neighbors or you know how other people are doing. So thanks. I'm also gonna ask Eric Viola from, from Deloitte about you know this question about you know data quality and, and ensuring that we have you know good quality um, in our system. Yeah, sure. So I'm not going to speak as a water data management specialist like John and others because that's not my background. I'll speak as a practitioner and a water engineer. Um, I've dealt with data, I've worked with data for over 30 years. Uh, at Deloitte, we definitely do what John just said. That is, we involve stakeholders and partners in data from A to Z, from the collection to the analysis to the use to the monitoring, because um, I like what John said about the quality relies on people actually using data. I think that's that's really important. Uh, a couple of anecdotes um, to illustrate what, what data means in different places. A few years ago, I was working on WASH in Ethiopia, and UNICEF pushed for a new program called OneWASH, which was very interesting. And they convinced the government to collect data, which was a good thing. Uh, the thing is that they got very excited, very enthusiastic. They collected a lot of data. They collected data, I believe, on 50 or 100,000 households. And the questionnaire had 200 or 300 questions. So that's more than 10 million data points. Uh, it's dizzy. Even John could not deal with that. <laughs> Um, and uh, two years after they had started the collection, they also did it with old school paper questionnaires. They didn't yet have mWater or another application to do that. So two years after the start, they were still sorting the data. Two years after, they were still trying to analyze the data and they were running out of money. At that point, how relevant is that data? It's four year old. So um, I'll... Um, conclude on this by um, uh, quoting a friend of mine, university professor who's a data expert. And one thing he taught me at the very beginning, he said, Eric, data for what? The first thing you have to wonder about is why are you collecting data for? What is the minimum amount of data do you need? The rest is just noise and distracting noise. So I think that's the first thing about, about data, um, data quality. Um, I think that's, yeah, that's the first point I wanted to make. Um, and and we, when we look at why do we need data, well, we know there are plenty of questions we want to answer. We want to compare alternative solutions. We want to be proactive and not reactive. We want to monitor. We want to understand uh, the consequences and the impacts of our decisions and everyday practices. 
Uh, we want to understand the extent and the magnitude of problems, how much water there is, um, how, how dirty or how clean is the water. Um, I think there are uh, lots of challenges with water data quality. Um, I'll, I'll leave that to, to the experts here. I like what we said about standardization. Um, there was at the UNC conference in October, there was what I thought was a very interesting presentation uh, by, uh, I believe, World Vision actually, and, and Emory University. They were commenting that in the medical research field, there are protocols on how to report the results of medical experiments. Uh, we don't have that in the wash sector. You could have uh, a report that looks at uh, a wash program and is going to talk about the context, the baseline, and the results, but not talk about the approaches. And then you'll have another report on another country that's not going to talk about the context, is only going to talk about the approaches and the results. So now, how do you compare these two? Maybe these two programs are very similar, but based on these two uh, papers, you cannot compare them. So um, I think when we talk about standardization of data, there's also standardization of reporting so that we can learn from each other and learn from, uh, from experience. Um, one, a couple more points I want to make is, nowadays we are bombarded with data. Um, so, um, I mean, for me, it's dizzy. Um, so we also need to teach critical thinking. We need to teach people, uh, starting with kids, um, how to sort through that data and choose the ones they really need. Uh, I, I think that's, uh, that's, also, uh, yeah, that's also critical. We also need to talk about data presentation because there is raw data and there is what we say is data. In the ministry in Egypt, they talk about cooking data. From one floor to another, with the same raw data, you will have completely opposite conclusions as to how much water there is in a specific part of the country. So uh, that's also something to, um, to, to keep in mind. Um, I think I'll, I'll, I'll stop there because I could go. <laughs> Thank you, thank you, Eric, so much. And yeah, it's great, a great point about you know data for for what's sake too, and thinking about you know the big volumes of data in Ethiopia and and sorting through that is is a lot of work. So making sure that we're thinking about the user and how that data is going to be used, which is actually a perfect segue into our next slide um, here about you know it's not just about raw data, but it's about data insights. You know, so so what does that data mean? In what format? <laughs> can it be in so that it's useful for decision makers? So our next commitment is around developing open source or low cost interfaces that use data analytics and tracking trends. And I wanna ask engineer Lambert from, from Uganda about this and, and how they are using data for decision making and how we can think about more useful formats for that process. Uh. Thank you for, for, for that. Uh, first, I want to just quickly mention about um, the types of data that we, we, we pick quickly. We have population data that comes from the National Population uh, and Census uh, Organization, the Canada Bureau of Statistics. But we also pick data on safe water sources. We pick data on water quality. Um, of course, this is through uh, physical testing. The, the water. We also pick data on functionality, and in the Ugandan context, functionality is defined as uh, <coughs> uh, the status of a, a facility uh, at the time of spot check. So if I check today, it's not working. If I don't go back five years later, it will still indicate that that facility is not working, even if it was repaired the day after I visited. And so it comes to the issue of data quality. Uh, we also pick data on equity, um, per capita investment, or the distances that people walk to, to a facility. Um, so majorly, this, this data is, um, is used for allocating resources. Uh, we, we, we have a, a decentralized system of government with the local governments uh, are being responsible for service delivery. So this data is all combined into a model and um, and uh, it's used to allocate resources. So you can imagine that there's a lot of competition as far as data is concerned. 
Sometimes certain data gives you a lot of resources, and then another data will provide uh, minimize the resources that you get. So we 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 have a, a, a national uh, what we call a water supply database. It's accessible. You 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 you, you can go to the website and you you access data from that from that from that database, and it will indicate um, in terms of access. And, and other other parameters that are available uh, in that database for 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 use. So I know that many organizations are able to access that the organizations that are working in Uganda to be able to access that data, and they can use it for planning. They can use it for allocating resources. They can use it to decide which areas of the country that investments are directed to. So that's really uh, what I can say. But also. I want to say that uh, I, I, I had earlier said that this is really a, a manual system, manual in the sense that um, M Water has presented a, a, a kind of system where you can click on a particular water uh, point and you will know the status of that water. The system we have now is until somebody physically walks there and updates the status, you, you will not know. And many times when we go to parliament, we are confronted with the facts. Uh, you probably have in your database information that is five years old, and the member of parliament who's coming from that area has the latest information, and then you go into an argument of whether your data is correct or not. Yes, that, that's a that's big issue. Thank you. Great. Well, yeah, thank, thank you so much for giving us some real examples of, of what it's like on the ground to you know, use what data is being used and, and how it's being used for planning and for allocating resources, um, which is a great segue to our, our last commitment about allocating funding for improving technical capacity and infrastructure to collect and maintain data. So I wanted to ask Kia from the Hilton Foundation about, you know, where are there resource or capacity gaps that need to be addressed? And how does the Hilton Foundation see themselves in, in helping to guide the allocation of resources? Great, thanks for that question. So I come from a bit of an economics background. So when I hear this, I think of supply and demand. Um, so you know, obviously you can have you know, great quality data, but if there's no demand, it's not gonna be used. And the reverse is true as well. If there's demand for data, but you have poor quality data, it's also not going to be used. So you know, I feel like you have to find this intersection of, of supply and demand in order to get decision makers and policy makers to actually use data. Um, and so you know, in terms of building that demand, um, you, know, you have to develop that data culture within governments. Um, so finding those data champions within government, um, also you know, building building that culture and understanding of you know how do you use data, everything from data collection to data analysis to the, the using of data. Um, and then on the supply side, you, know, you have to make sure that you're getting you know, high quality data, but also data that's responsive to government needs. Um, and that is packaged in a way that is user friendly, right? So it has to be high quality, it also has to be timely, um, it has to be up to date, um, and it has to really respond to, to the needs of, of the users. Um, so, you know, one of the, you've heard a lot about M Water already, um, but I just want to talk a little bit about um, our experience with M Water. Uh, so, it's a bit of background. The Hilton Foundation was looking into uh, moving into a new district in Uganda, uh, but in order to see if this was a good time for investment, we needed to do some due diligence. And as part of that, we wanted to um, collect some data on, on water in the district. Uh, but we didn't want this data to just exist in a vacuum buried in the Hilton Foundation. So we also wanted to make sure that government was involved and wanted to see what the needs were of the, the local district government. Um, and so as part of this, um, you know, we were able to try and make this responsive to the, the district government's needs. And it, you know, there ended up being a very fortunate timing because I think there was also this big national push in Uganda to get better, high quality data on water. Uh, and so, you know, I think that demand was there because there were these champions within Uganda, you know, who, who wanted to get this data and wanted to use this data. Um, and so right now, you know, we're trying to work with them water to scale this up, like outside of just the district and work at this national level 
Um, you know, and it's great because there is this, this data culture that's developing within Uganda, um, and also M Water is providing that that supply of high quality, timely data, and also very user friendly, right? Something that that the government can actually take and incorporate and, and run with it, um, rather than some of the older systems that that they're using. Um, so this is something that you know the Hilton Foundation is really excited to be supporting. Um, you know, and I think you know we're always interested in trying to, to support government and you know making making things responsive to government needs. Great. Yeah. Th thanks so much. Yeah, it's great to have this synergy with Uganda and here, you know, the example from, from different perspectives, too. So now we're actually going to open it up. I'm going to invite Jessica back um, to lead a, a discussion, you know, with, with we want to make sure we have room for audience participation, which we feel like is something that's been lacking a little bit at the conference overall on UN Water. So, um, you know, I think we're going to open it up and, yeah, think of questions you want us panelists, and um, I'll pass it back. Great. Thanks, Rachel. Uh, yes, and if I can ask um, oh, Rachel, Rachel can help with um, questions. So, yeah, so we want to open it up um, to audience questions. If you have questions on, on what has already been discussed by the panelists, feel free to bring those forward. Um, we also, so we have, we've been through sort of five draft commitments that we put together, and we're happy to have your feedback on those as well. Um, so at the end of every official side session, UN Water has asked us to submit a summary of this session. So we will be sharing the notes from our discussion, but we want to make sure that we have some, you know, agreement and, and really think through if these if these are kinds of the commitments that we can, that are realistic and that people can actually take concrete steps towards in the future. Um, you know, the whole idea of this conference is to, to make commitments so that um, we sort of, we start to move the needle a little bit. And um, we would love to see sort of a um, stronger sort of data culture and, and a kind of a movement around some of these commitments where we can really see many organizations and governments getting behind them um, and, and really kind of prioritizing data, data science and evidence-based policy making. So um, with that, I'm gonna open it up to um, folks in the room. And I know that we are also accepting questions online through Zoom. So if you have a question and you're joining us by Zoom, go ahead and put that in the chat. And as we get further along, I'll ask my colleague Lisa to, to, to pull out a couple of questions from the chat in Zoom as well. So I saw two hands back here, Rachel. Oh, thanks for is this on? Uh, it might not be. Look up. I'll speak loud. <laughs> we ask that you use the mic so that folks on Zoom can hear you as well. Um, thanks. Thanks for being patient. Okay, no worries. Uh, okay, I just wanted to, <coughs> to share something about that. One second, we, um, uh, to share some uh, uh, of my own experiences on data collection and uh, maybe get some of your feedback. Uh, standardization was mentioned by one of, one of you and the quality of data. Uh, so it's true that there are differences between what UNICEF this, uh, the, the definition, the Indonesian government definition of what is uh, sanitation and then you have what local people care about. They're all a bit different, um, especially the category basic sanitation. Uh, you can have very bad basic sanitation, you can have very good basic sanitation. So you need to subdivide uh, that kind of thing. So we found that it was actually not hard to do. Uh, together with the Global Water Partnership, uh, we taught Indonesian villages themselves to, uh, to collect their own data through an app, a very simple survey app. Um, <coughs> they use this, this survey app, use the global and national definitions as well as stuff that actually matters to people. Uh, for instance, for basic sanitation, we, we ask, like, is your system smelly? Does it overflow from time to time? All these kind of things that are relevant for local people. So they, those questions were in there. Uh, you can reuse the app very simple because you, the app generates a barcode. Uh, so you put the barcode on the window. So you want to use the app again. Well, they have the app themselves, the villagers. They just ask the next round of questions. So it's, uh, it's, it was very good. We did... 1,500 families in just two weeks, and it costs 50 cents per family. And you get incredibly detailed data. Uh, so the, the quality of the data is inherently guaranteed because it's collected by the people themselves, and they want to make sure that they get the data right because they, they need to, uh, to uh, data could be audited by the regional authorities and so, so they want to get it right. It's, it's after all about their own community. 
Uh, so the results were very engaging and they were shocking at the same time. They realized like, wow, not a single one of us has safe sanitation, not even one of us. And, uh, and it got immediate buy-in because we were doing the WASH program. Uh, so immediately people wanted to be engaged because they realized like how difficult is it in their village it, with their own data, they got to choose which, uh, which villages would get help first. And so, um, so we saw that those data were interesting for the sponsors, but also interesting for the local community and for the, uh, the regional authorities. So the same dynamics in Indonesia was also in play in Nepal. I'm sure that the data model can work anywhere because villages all over the world globe uh, seem to think similarly. The uh, problem is that um, our server is not very, uh, very good, it's very slow, so we clearly need to have companies, I think, who get involved in developing these kind of apps, make it very stable, very fast, and who can help us to, to show the world how important that <coughs> are, because we all know that data are very important, but uh, uh, I, I think this is where I hope that people can come up with, with help to get on board. Great, thank you for that really nice example of, of getting local communities involved in data collection. Um, I think we'll go ahead and move to the next question. And if, actually, if you can introduce yourself. Yeah, sure. Yes, please um, my, introduce yourself. My name is Samuel Jara. I work for WASH. I'm the technical director for uh, WASH and also in charge of quality and innovation. Uh, the issue of data for us is very key. Uh, as Italina was rightly saying, we come into uh, any site or any region, we need data. Data to plan, data to implement, data to learn out of it, and data to know the trends, challenges, and the weaknesses. One of them is the water table technician, which is also very important, and data provide those information. My concern about uh, data collection and data management today is about um, segregating data. Since the world is world, human being is collecting data. When should we throw some data because of the definition of the standard? When should we keep the data? When should we recycle the data so we will have a long um, record of the same data, even if parameters are changing, they still inform on the trend. The population is moving, changing every day. The same water quality is changing. The same water table is changing. We are talking about climate change. How can we con create continuity in the data, even if we are taking higher standards, even if we are defining it differently? How can we keep the train? Thank you. Thank you so much. Are there any panelists that want to respond about, um, you know, even as the, the definitions change, which they, they will continue to do so, especially if we work towards better alignment, but how do we make sure we don't lose that historical perspective and that we're really understanding John, thanks. Oh, this, this, is, this is probably a more technical answer, but there also is a, a, a social answer as well. Um, so uh, we, you know, there are technical ways of doing this. So, you know, in, in our system, we've developed a, a separation between the infrastructure definitions, which can be very, you know, simple, like the name and the location and the GPS coordinates and things like that, and the surveys that you do against that to record parameters over time. Um, so this is like the fundamental of a, of a relational database, and you know you'll you hear this term in, in any kind of software that's being used for a real time system. I think the problem is in the past we were doing these episodic surveys very rarely, and by the time they went back to do another survey, you know the they couldn't even find the locations you know that were in the previous one. Uh, so I think there is technology that's being brought to bear towards solving that problem. But then the other the other issue is probably more about um, you know who's the, you know the demand for that data and who's going back to check and how are we empowering the, those um, local extension agents or the district water offices which are always underfunded and always you know lacking in resources like motorbikes and things like that. So 
I think that's a financial social question also still we're, we're working on solving uh, with, with our with our counterparts and government uh, as well. Anybody else want to? Um, yeah, I offer uh, another perspective on historical data. Uh, when I started working on hydrology, um, I was uh, looking for data, for rain data and river flow data, so that I could forecast uh, flood uh, and river flows. Okay, And that was 30 years ago, and we didn't talk that much about climate change. Okay, Nowadays, can we say with certainty that the future is going to replicate the past? Well, we cannot. I mean, 30 years ago, we knew climate changes. We thought the changes were beyond a generation. But it was a century. So if we have 50 years of data, that's something solid. Today, the climate is changing pretty fast. So we need to be humble. Historical data is useful. It's important, but we need to be very humble when we use it to predict. Because uh, the other bias of engineers like me is that we predict and then we go for the best solution based on those predictions. I would argue that nowadays we have to think a bit differently. We have to adopt a bit of uh, robust decision making, which is we look at the range of uncertainties we are dealing with, we look at the range of solutions, Maybe we should pick the solution that's the most resilient based on the range of possible futures. So it's different from having a predictive approach. So historical data can be used. I would just say that we have to use it with, with more and more caution nowadays. Great, thank you both so much. Um, Lisa, can we have a question from the chat? Or do you want, do you need a minute to? Rachel can hand you her mic. Yeah, so I, I just want to acknowledge I, we have around 75 people joining us online, which is wonderful. Thank you all for getting up so early. Oh, we're uh, sorry, we're going to take one more question from the audience and then we'll we'll take one from the chat. Thanks. Good morning, everyone. Um, I am Randolph, technical advisor for Life and Geo. Like, um, I first want to apologize for coming in. I came here today uh, bearing a difficulty in mind and hoping I'll get an, an answer from this. Uh, Life and Geo, today we are trying to digitalize all our infrastructures. So watch closely what World Vision was doing, and we, we came to notice M water. So watch closely how people use M water. And uh, today we are, I'm trying to ask, we are looking for a solution to have a real-time data on the functionality of an infrastructure, of water infrastructure. And watching what M water does, we saw what uh, M water is doing in Kenya with uh, VVD, so um, today, we, um, I was coming today hoping this topic will be will be talked about using sensors on uh, infrastructures that can give us real time data whether the, the infrastructure is functional and whether uh, the water quality is 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 changing. Yes or no? So that's really what I was bearing in mind. I don't know if it was approached before my arrival. Well, please, I I really need a solution to this. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah. Do any of our panelists want to talk about? Um... <laughs> real-time data and some of the benefits and maybe some of the challenges of using sensors uh, to collect that data. Well, come talk to me later. <laughs> <laughs> or any other programs using sensors? I don't know about global communities or world vision. Applying sensors in your programs? Uh, we, oh. Okay, thank you. We, we are trying to uh, use sensors, especially for groundwater monitoring in Uganda. And um, of course, I know there are a number of uh, organizations <coughs> uh, I could think about that uh, are providing sensors, especially those people who make uh, submersible pumps. Yeah, because you are able to insert a pump under <coughs> and it, it could give you the flow real time, how much water the pump is, is delivering. Uh, I think some sensors uh, go to the extent of, of giving you the, the water quality and things like temperature of the water and the pH and so on. Yeah, that is, is already uh, developed. I, I just need to find out uh, those organizations that are already providing sensors for uh, off, off uh, site uh, uh, picking of data in, in as far as 
groundwater <coughs> is concerned. And, and I'm sure you could use it for surface water as well. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so I think we'll go to, if we can go to a question online, Lisa, from our webinar participants. Sure, yep. Um, thank you. And really great discussion. Lots going on online. <laughs> great, exciting. I can't see the online chat, so, but I'll look at it. <laughs> Yeah, so I could ask a couple questions from here, and then there are a couple of just shorter resource questions. So there will be four, but two of them are for the panelists and two are more general. Um, the first question is, so we have talked a lot about data for decision makers, but one of the questions online is how do we make data that we collect useful to beneficiaries? So the water users or customers, um, other, other stakeholders in the wash supply chain, um, and then another question is around um, so very much agreeing with Kia on the comment about better understanding the demand side of the data ecosystem and how Alberto also spoke to this. So how much does the panel think we collectively as a sector should invest more in understanding the needs of data consumers, especially at the local government level, in terms of how they access data and what they can actually do with the data given low resource environments. And then two just shorter, um, more directional questions is, one, someone online asked where they could access the Acquire Wash Atlas. They're looking for that. And the other one is that there is um, someone online from Kenya who is very interested in helping with the data collection effort and was wondering if you all had any partners that you knew of on the ground that are actively working in this space in Kenya. Thanks so much. Just for the resource questions, um, we can have a quiet a colleague drop those um, that information in the chat. I'm not sure if Vanessa's online, but she can drop it in. If not, Rachel and I can address those later. Um, if you can uh, also, um, you can put my email in the chat and people are free, free to email me later for additional questions. Um, so the first question on how do we make data uh -huh. beneficial to our beneficiaries? Um, I think I'll pose that to, to our implementing partners, World Vision and Global Communities um, who, who really probably have the best sense of what communities are looking for. Yes, uh, really important. Um, uh, the first step uh, is to make the tools um, smart and available. Uh, when we talk about open data sources, that communities themselves can access to that information. In our days, we can see that even in the rural communities, they have smartphones, they have internet. So if we make this data available in a um, sharing source data, uh, if we make data like open source, the community themselves that can access. World Vision, for example, is also using mWater, and mWater is an open source. Everyone can go there and see that information there and community themselves. And uh, this is a discussion that for us as implementing partners, we are also having that discussion. How can we make this information available for the communities, for the governments? So uh, if we combine uh, all our information, I believe that it will be uh, something um, that all of us, uh, we can use to, 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 to make uh, decisions for, them, for the communities to see. Our water point is there, it's really working. Uh, it's not working, they can report on that. Our water point is not, is not working. So everyone can see, the government, the partners can see, that, okay, this water point is not working. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Adelina. Um, Alberto, did you want to weigh in on, on this as well, about how to make it more beneficial for the communities and the beneficiaries themselves? Definitely, yeah, thank you. Uh, I, I have uh, different approaches to this question. Uh, number one, for example, in the case of Ghana, uh, from the district assembly point of view, for example, the data that they need, it's in terms of coverage. Uh, when a new organization comes to support them, they want to avoid duplication. Uh, it's very difficult for a newcomer to understand where, who, who's working where and what's being done. And it's overable over and over this repetition where you have to look every time you want to do something, you have to search for data that should be readily available for everyone. 
the same for the private sector. I insist on the private sector, small uh, social enterprises that want to be involved on the, on the water distribution. Uh, again, it's very difficult for them which communities are served, which communities are not being served. And uh, from existing water uh, mechanized points, uh, can they be expanded just by laying a pipe, for example? That data is not available, and you have to work very hard to, to obtain that data. So with a solid um, database available with mapping, with all, all what is required, it can be done. So um, somebody was talking about collecting data uh, with sensors. Uh, these days you have uh, water pumps, you have valves, you have uh, uh, you can measure uh, via GPS the amount of water that is flowing or if a, a pump has break down. So all these things are, are there. Our uh, data is available. It's just a matter of channeling that for the benefit of the communities and the benefit of the local government, which at the end will help the, the, the country as a, as a whole. Also, not only, well, we have to differentiate also drinking water from uh, uh, like agriculture use water, where uh, data can be also very beneficial. And uh, for uh, herders that are moving their cattle or their sheep, also that data is very important. We're doing something with that in, in, in Kenya with a program called Afri Scout, where it provides real time data where people can move their cattle and, and get uh, better. Uh, they can get number one water points where they can drink water and number two where are greener uh, environments so definitely um, they said information is power and, and and quality data makes that power uh, so if we can translate that power into the community at, at the community level that's where we're going to make a real impact so i'll pause here over to you Thank you so much, Alberto. I appreciate that. The second question we had um, from our webinar participants was about better understanding the demands from local governments. So I think oftentimes the burden of data collection falls on district level offices, but they're not always getting the feedback and being able to interact with data interfaces the way um, national governments might be getting. So they, they collect the data, but they don't always get feedback. That feedback loop doesn't always come to them. Um, so any panelists want to talk about better understanding what kind of data and what kind of information do our local government offices need? Perhaps we can direct that to uh, the assistant commissioner. Uh, last week we had um, we had what we call the Uganda Water and Environment Week. Really, that brings in a lot, lot of all stakeholders as far as water governance is concerned. And one of the key questions that uh, one of the district leaders asked was if we had a database and, uh, and, and the other one was how reliable it was. So I think for the local uh, governments, they, they need to know that we, we have a database that they can rely on. Uh, so, so for me, it's, it's really about the reliability of the data. That's the biggest question. Reliability of the data that we have in our systems. Because much of this data is used for planning, much of this data is used for resource allocation, like I told you, and much of this data is used for uh, determining where investments should be targeted or directed. So if we have that, then we should be sure that we have useful information that is helpful to the local governments. Great, thank you so much. Okay, we're going to take one more question from the audience before we wrap up today. I saw Andrew's hand go up first, yeah. <laughs> very enthusiastically. So I'm hoping he has an excellent question that is really going to tie it all together for us. I do. Great. I don't follow this, Andrew. <laughs> <laughs> if you're animated, you get noticed a lot better, right? So uh, my name is Andrew Armstrong. I work with Uptime Global. Uh, we use operational data from rural hand pump maintenance and water service providers to um, calculate results-based payments based on their performance. Um, my question is actually on the demand for data, but it's it's on the funding and finance side. 
Um, so I'm, I'm just wondering, this is a question for all the panelists, but maybe particularly for uh, Engineer Lambert. Um, do you have any stories of how investments in better quality data, improved data has enhanced uh, relationships with invest, investment partners, uh, maybe led to additional funding and finance opportunities or you know, any kind of stories where it's like maybe unlocked more money coming into the system? Thanks. Um, uh, we, in, in Uganda now, we are, um, like I, I told you, one of the challenges we had was um, is, um, the, the data is the, the entire system of data collection, uh, storage, and um, analysis is, is, is a manual process. And so right now, we, we've, we've managed to get resources from the World Bank. And the idea is that we are going to build infrastructure in terms of equipping from the lowest level. And the lowest level here in, our, in terms of our governance is the lowest administrative level is a village. And then you go up to uh, parish level, you go to sub county, you go to district and to the regional level, and then that data will come to, to the center. In, in this case, the Ministry of Water and Environment. So now the infrastructure that is there is that the, the data is collected by a district level. So in terms of local governance, it's, it's really the highest level. And none of this information is kept at the lower levels. So when it comes to upgrading or updating this data, you will still have to go back. And so it's very expensive. So we want to make sure that we have a system where the lowest point of data collection and the administration can be anchored. And so with the World Bank uh, financing, we, we are going to, 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 to equip the lowest level, which is the parish level. So there will be administrative rights for people to approve this data at that lower level to ensure that it's correct. And then it goes to the next level, to the next level, and it will end up at the ministry. All this is being done to ensure that we are having reliable data. And this is also going to be online. So we will not have people collecting data on paper and driving 500 kilometers to bring the data to Kampala. So uh, we are already seeing that many of these donors who are financing the sector are interested in data. And so we think that once we build this system, there is going to be a lot of support coming from many people, from UNICEF, from many other organizations that have been mentioned here to try to build that reliability and uh, also help us with the tracking progress as far as WASH is concerned. So that, that's the best example that I can give. Thank you. Thank you. Um, with that, we're going to wrap up the, the questions part. Um, I, I know there are a lot of other hands out there. I really hope that you will stay a few minutes afterwards to speak to the panelists directly. There's also a ton of food back there. So please um, mingle and enjoy the breakfast and continue to ask your questions and have your discussions um, in person with everyone. Um, so before we wrap up, we really wanted to put some pressure on the organizations that have joined us today to tell us, okay, now what? What steps are your organizations gonna take to actually implement a better data culture moving forward? Um, and so all of our panelists today have drafted commitments, and these are going to be included in the summary document that we submit to the conference, and we're very pleased to see all these organizations taking some steps. Rachel already mentioned the Quayas. Ours is to um, make all of our non-confidential data collected um, through our projects open source and publicly available, and this goes along with the, um, there is already a commitment put forth by ECRAC, I think Rachel mentioned. Yes. Yeah, I'm uh, I'm working for IGRAC. So okay, IGRAC. Questions about that one. Also, if you want to contribute as an individual, because those are the traditions, feel free to come to me. Yes, yes. So IGRAC already has a draft commitment specifically on um, open data. So the hashtag is open water data. Is that correct? So you can check that out. We don't want to have um, you know parallel things going on. We want to get behind that one. So open that data, water data. Please support that. 
Um, I, we won't have time to go through all the partner commitments today, um, but we will. They will be in the summary document. But any of our panelists want to share your commitment um, before everyone today? Feel free to step forward. I've got them. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, my my personal commitment is to continue to educate uh, partners and stakeholders on how to better use uh, data. I said earlier, we need to teach people uh, what it is that they need data for. I think that's that's the first thing. The second thing, and, and I speak also from experience, is it's important to know before you measure or calculate something to know what is the magnitude of the data you're going to get back because it impacts the tool you're going to use uh, you're not going to measure the distance to the moon and the bacteria with the same ruler so it's important to know and also to apply critical thinking because i've seen too many times people uh, getting results from computers or from from data sensors and they're like oh wow five wow okay five no you should know before if five is an acceptable answer if it's logical, it makes sense. And, and so critical thinking is really important. As I said earlier, we are bombarded with data. So that's, um, that's, that's critical. And the last point I make is we also need to teach people how to use data for decision making, uh, you know, the pressure on right now because JMP has a lot of data, you do a lot of work with it, so um, what's your commitment to us? Our commitment is around um, transparency and sharing. So we do compile a lot of data and some of it, you know, we can't share the raw data, but we can definitely share the, the, the summarized data. And a lot of that is already publicly available on our websites, but it's not easy to find um, or access. So we want to make the, the compiled data more accessible and also the methods. And we would we use statistical scripts to process the data. We want to make those available too, so people can really understand, you know, how these data are being used to produce the estimates. So data transparency. Wonderful. Thank you. We'll we'll end on that note. Thank you to the others who have shared your commitments. As I I've got them up on the screen, but and thank you to all the panelists today. Let's give them a round of applause. <laughs> Um, and with that, we're going to ask Lisa Schechtman, who's the Senior Strategic Engagement Advisor from USAID um, in their Center for Water Security and Sanitation to help us close and wrap up today, today's event. Thanks, Lisa. Uh, thank you all so much, um, and congratulations on making it here on time. Um, I uh, would just want to acknowledge um, Excellencies and distinguished colleagues, both in the room and online, um, and just say all protocol observed. Um, I hope you all had a great World Water Day yesterday and an energizing start to this historic conference. I will try to be super energized so that you can go forth into the rest of your crazy day um, with some fun things to think about. Um, the United States has never been more optimistic about the role of data in accelerating our progress on SDG 6, water security, uh, sanitation, and hygiene, or more committed to ensuring that data are used to make decisions large and small. Um, but I do want to um, pause before I continue with my comments on our uh, actions against these commitments, just to remind us that all of these data are ultimately about people. They are about changing lives, improving lives, collaborating with communities, making sure that the data we are focused on tells us how to respond to the challenges that people are facing in the real world. Um, so I think it's really important for us to ground truth all of these conversations because it's very easy to get caught up in uh, cool technology or um, big picture ideas or other things like that. So just, I just want to pause us to remember why we're really here. Um, the United States Global Water Strategy has elevated data innovation and learning into a cross-cutting principle 
that applies to all 14 federal government uh, departments and agencies that are implementing the strategy. And that's a huge innovation for us and a huge um, shift in how we prioritize data from our 2022 strategy um, that wasn't quite as clear in our 2017 strategy. And we're really excited about that. Yesterday, the United States um, announced that we are making domestic and global commitments to the Water Action Agenda that total $49 billion worth of actions. And a number of those commitments are related to data, again, large and small. So for example, uh, NASA, has committed to open data um, from what will be returned by its surface water ocean topography mission or its SWAT satellite, which is like, you know, if we want to talk about cool data technology, that basically is just the coolest. Um, they will be gathered, the satellite will be gathering data to establish the first ever global survey of Earth's surface water. And all of these data, which will be available open source when they start being returned next year, I think. Satellites are really far away and data takes a while. Um, and they can be used to make really um, climate-informed decisions around surface water challenges that we're all facing. Um, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, or NOAA, also made a series of announcements related to early warning systems for floods and droughts in multiple countries and regions around the world. Again, trying to ensure that water systems and associated systems like food um, are able to plan ahead for disasters or climate change impacts that might reduce the impact of the systems that we've all worked so hard to build. Um, USAID has invested in improving water and sanitation evidence-based decision-making as well. Um, we've worked uh, on such issues at the national level in countries ranging from Haiti, Ghana, um, to Mozambique and Madagascar. But we're also working very much at the global level. Um, and our hope is to really contribute to closing the gaps that our colleague from Uganda has pointed out. Because again, if we remember that we're here because of people, then our priority needs to be making sure that national governments who are focused on their people have the tools and the systems and the know-how to do, uh, to make their own decisions in collaboration with those communities. And so I, I thank you, sir, for, for elevating that challenge so that we can all kind of keep our eyes on that prize. At the global level, we've supported um, the majority of the standard bearers, JMP, GLASS, IBNET, um, Northwestern University's HWISE work, which if you haven't looked at it, is a really um, interesting data set that actually gets into human experiences of water insecurity in ways that we haven't had before. And we're trying to see how we can incorporate that into our decision making as well. And when appropriate, we're aligning our own indicators against these standards so that we can um, compare and contribute to comparable data most effectively. And, and we try to encourage our, our partners to do the same. Where the global community still lacks metrics that allow us to target well and to focus on comparable data that can allow us to all rally toward the same thing, we are collaborating with partners to encourage data harmonization. So an example here would be um, data on menstrual health and hygiene, which JMP has taken a brave and bold and wonderful step forward in, in 2021, providing us with the first global data set. But there are still a number of survey and proposed survey instruments that are out there that some of which are very, very long, 200 questions, things like that, that we've already heard about that we know can't be used decision-making. And so we've been working with JMP and others to try and come up with a meaningful set of metrics that we can all drive towards. But using all of these standards and harmonizing all of these indicators internally isn't enough. We've heard a lot about open data sharing, and this is something that's also really important to the U.S. government. Um, and some of you might have seen President Biden's Open Government National Action Plan 
where we've all committed as the federal government to transparently sharing taxpayer funded research and data collection where it's safe and appropriate. And I'll come back to that phrase in a moment. Um, data collected under USA contracts is required to be posted through USA's digital development library so that we can all use it, benefit from it, um, challenge it if appropriate, um, but kind of move forward collectively. We've also increased our work to elevate existing data that haven't been well used or that we think um, deserve a little, a little push. And particularly, um, we've done this with data that helps us focus on inequities in the sector. So for example, data on ethnic inequalities in access to WASH, um, data on the impact of water access for small and medium enterprises around the world, not just water and sanitation enterprises, but recognizing the role of water in jobs creation and in promoting a sound economy. Um, and most recently, for the first time in October, we published the data that power our own assessments of how we prioritize um, water and sanitation in, in our 22 high priority countries around the world, including Uganda and Ghana. And then finally, we are committed to going beyond data to invest in decision support tools, um, including with many of you in the room, many of the tools that we've heard about today. The goal is to really translate data into something we can act on. And I think we've heard some good examples, and there are many more um, that we can probably spend the rest of the day talking about. To advance these priorities further, um, I'm pleased to announce that USAID will be launching a new global investment focused on improving the collection and use of water and sanitation data to enable decision making. And that, that end goal is really important here. These and other partnerships will help all of us figure out where we can have the greatest impact with a given investment. How can we target most effectively? Um, they will help us shine a light on those being left behind. Um, oftentimes data don't go to that level and we will never achieve universal access unless we zero in on those questions. Um, and these investments also aim to provide a, an objective voice for those folks who are usually not invited to the table. Um, before I close, I, I promise to come back to this. I just want to say a word on this phrase, to the extent safe and appropriate. Um, and there was kind of an allusion to it in some of the, um, the final questions from our virtual audience. Go virtual people, you're on it today. Um, equity is a major priority for the Biden-Harris administration. This cuts across everything the U.S. government does. It's very prominent in the White House Action Plan on Global Water Security and in the U.S. Global Water Strategy. Um, and as I said, we really have to focus some of our data collection efforts on the people who are not being reached, understand why they aren't being reached, and more importantly, to understand what they want and what they need. Um, but as we continue to grapple with these really deep and persistent inequalities um, that GLASS and JMP have helped us to understand, we must prioritize new do no harm approaches to research and data collection in this space. Um, that includes participation. Um, who are the enumerators? Who are designing, the, who is designing the surveys? Who is analyzing the data and who is disseminating the results? Uh, we also need to ensure free prior and informed consent for people level investigations. And we need to promote easy to understand and easy to use data protection tools. Um, our desire to better target investments um, to close inequalities can put people who are facing inequalities at risk if we do not prioritize these issues. Um, so an example that we've been grappling with in, in the USA is how do we disaggregate by gender and not by sex? LGBTQI plus persons who face particular challenges in accessing sanitation can also be put in harm's way if we are not very careful about how we understand their needs. 
So this is just a, a bit of a challenge to all of us to, to keep in mind we're here for people and all of the demand side and service side data that we've talked about today are critically important, but we do really have more work to do to achieve SDG 6 and to make sure that we have the data for everybody to make informed decisions. Um, but at the end of the day, we share the vision that everybody has put forward today and um, and hope to be able to collaborate with many of you on achieving our collective commitments. Uh, good data needs to be shared efficiently and routinely used to improve quality and accelerate progress. Um, and we look forward to working with all of you to, to make that happen so we can achieve SDG 6. Thanks.